So, let's get started with our first session. Before we do that, um, a few uh, organizational remarks. You all have uh, received the link to, the, to this web card application, I assume. Not only those here in the room, but also those that are, that are watching uh, from wherever they are. Um, you can use this web card tool to ask questions. So for those in the room, you can always raise your hand and ask questions, of course. But uh, if, if you prefer, you can also use this web card. And the same is true uh, for those uh, that join remotely. And if you do so, I will have a look. I have a, I have a tablet here, and I'll look at this tablet regularly. So when a question comes up and I see it on there and we have enough time, I will be happy to bring it up. So this is an invitation for everybody to participate. Um, I would now like to ask uh, the first uh, three panelists uh, to join me here uh, on the stage. Uh, Venencia, Paul, and Christoph. I will, I will introduce you later, but so that, you, so that you're just uh, on the stage here with me. The first session we are going to talk about uh, global uh, digital readiness, enabling a powerful digital postal ecosystem. And as we all know, a successful and uh, inclusive digital transformation of posts needs coordinated approaches, it needs innovative partnerships. And that's what we are here actually today for, it's partnerships. We are talking about partnerships in all our our sessions here. So digitization, we know that is transforming our industry, but it is also transforming customer needs, of course. So these trends are triggering considerable changes in the posts themselves, in their strategies. Um, they require them to increase reliability, transparency, security, sustainability, and efficiency to meet customer expectations, which are changing, as I said. So the UPU leads projects uh, that bring together key players to improve the digital capacity and also the digital capabilities of posts. And those projects have also as an objective to bridge the readiness, the digital readiness gaps that exist between countries and between regions. So in our first session here, we'll discuss how digital technologies are transforming the industry. We'll discuss how postal operators can leverage digital tools to become stronger, to become more reliable, more transparent, and everything that it needs to become more customer focused. Um, and we are going also to look at, uh, at a few of the successful UPU driven projects uh, that can support posts on their digital transformation journey. So let me quickly introduce our panelists here today. We have Anansia Sigauke, she's the Acting General Manager of Operations and Marketing at Zimbabwe Post. Welcome. We have Paul Danahoe, Coordinator Digital Policies and Trade at the UPU, and we have Christoph Kapka, who is the industry manager for Postland Parcel Services at SAP. And the way we are going to do is, uh, each of our panelists will have a few minutes to make, uh, to make an intervention, to make a short presentation, and after, <clears throat> after three or four, depending on the panel, presentations, we'll open the discussion. Okay, please, I would now like to invite Venencia to take the floor. You can do it from here or from there, however you prefer. Thank you. Uh, good day, everyone. Uh, all protocol is observed. Um, I think I've already been introduced. My name is Venencia Skauke. I'm from Zimbabwe Post. I'm the Acting General Manager, Marketing and Operations. And my presentation is mainly going to focus on um, how the Post is moving towards uh, global digital readiness. Uh, you can move over to the next slide. Yeah. So what you are seeing um, on my presentation... You have a clicker here as well. Oh, okay, thank you. So what you are seeing on my presentation, this is the Zimbabwe Postal Network, how the physical post office is widely distributed around the country. Uh, these are the post offices that we have. You can move over to the next slide. So Zimbabwe Post um, is a state-owned enterprise that is 100% owned by government. It was established in year 2000 following the unbundling of the Post on um, Telecommunications Corporation. Um, it is the designated operator in Zimbabwe, and it has got a network of um, over 240 postal outlets, as has been depicted on the um, first slide. We have 151 community information centers and also 39 containerized village information, information centers. These are um, the physical postal outlets that we have in Zimbabwe. You can move... Um, 
So um, as Zimbabwe Post, our digital strategy is mainly focused on uh, penetrating the international markets and also providing service to the domestic markets. And on the international market, uh, we have products like e-commerce, um, financial services through the fintech solutions, postal interoperability, and then on our domestic market, uh, we are focusing on e-government services, financial services, and on-demand logistics. And our main pillars for our business is the international pillar, the commercial pillar domestic-wise, and also our social pillar, because we are universally ob obligated to offer postal services uh, to the Zimbabwean public. And our mandate um, as a designated postal operator is to offer postal, courier, real estate, and financial services um, to the Zimbabwean publics and internationally. And uh, the digital opportunities um, for the post um, include one-stop fulfillment centers, taking advantage of the wide postal network that the post already has, the postal logistics, government services, retail banking, financial services, insurance, e-commerce. Um, the sky is the limit for the services that the post can offer to the transacting public, taking advantage of its physical uh, distribution, distribution, which is already wide. Uh, the post office, with uh, the advent of technology, has got an opportunity to offer services 24-7, 365, without uh, a limit of the conventional business hours. And the post cannot do it alone. It can do it through uh, multilateral agreements, collaborations, partnerships with both uh, the public and the private sector. So the advent of technology has brought about a lot of digital opportunities for the post office. And uh, the t technologies that are likely to benefit the post in the future, they are e-commerce and financial services. Uh, because of the already existing physical infrastructure, there's no better partner uh, or better organization to provide these digital services um, save for the post office. And on e-commerce, um, the business lines can differ depending on from one country to another, and this includes online shopping, uh, first mile and last mile delivery, online advertising, payment solution, warehousing services. And on financial services, um, our role is major in remittances, agency banking, banking services, disbursements, collection, payouts, insurance services. Uh, the list is actually endless um, in terms of the opportunities that the post can have. And um, this is a pictorial of our journey as Zimbabwe Post towards digitalization. Our aim by 2025 20, is to ensure that we move to, towards a smart post office. And um, we are already a few miles before we arrive to our journey, where we are currently on the Zimbabwe Mall, um, which is almost next to the post office as depicted pictorially, where we have launched an e-commerce platform where people can buy online, people can advertise online. We can do last mile and um, first mile delivery for partners that have, um, that have engaged us to offer those services already on their existing e-commerce platforms. So this picture is basically depicting our journey as Zimbabwe Post, and we are moving towards a smart post office where all services um, can be accessed digitally by people without necessarily visiting the physical post office and the post office offering that service on their behalf. People can shop whilst in the comfort of their homes and we can go a mile further by ensuring that we deliver those products and services to the customers. And uh, the growth window that we have seen as Zimbabwe Post is through e-commerce. Um, we, as Zimbabwe Post, developed an online shop in 2017 and it was initially named the, Zimbabwe, the Zimpost uh, Mall. We then rebranded it in 2020. We wanted to give it a national appeal because uh, by naming it the Zimpost, we thought it was limiting our customers who can actually uh, access um, the e-commerce services even as e-sellers. So we then rebranded it to Zimbabwe Post 
uh, where we gave it um, a national appeal, where we have various e-sellers who are actually sitting on that platform from grocery shops, pharmaceuticals, um, hardware, people who sell their products, small to medium and enterprises. They are now sitting on the Zimbabwe Mall because we gave it a national appeal. It was a mall for the country. And um, it's currently sitting on the dot post domain and we are using Shopify um, as the online shop technology. We chose uh, the dot post domain because it was easy for us to implement with um, the continuous and uh, fast changes that are happening in technology with dot post as Zimbabwe, as Zimbabwe post, we do not need to focus on um, various uh, upgrading because it's already covered under the dot post domain. The issue of cyber security cannot be overemphasized and it was also uh, less costly for us to implement and we, are, we also get 24-7, 365 support services from uh, the dot post group. And the benefits for, for digital readiness, um, these include, they encourage, Zimpost is among the um, operations readiness for e-commerce. And by, having, um, by being part of the readiness program, it encourages our services to be accelerated in terms of following the digital pace that is currently um, happening. We are able to develop the digital transformation concepts. It assists the posts to offer digital services. And um, I think I'll move over to, there are challenges that are associated with uh, adopting new technologies, and chief among them are beliefs and past experiences. So the need to change perception and continuously market uh, the digital platforms cannot be overemphasized, as people um, are not used to, to access services digitally, but they have got the experience of getting their service physically, so the need for us to change perception on um, offering services on digital platforms cannot be overemphasized. I will conclude my presentation presentation in saying that the post needs logistics infrastructure in the form of um, delivery equipment, e-commerce warehouses for us to participate um, strongly in this um, era. And the post cannot do it alone. They need to have partnerships, collaborations uh, for us to participate fully in the digital readiness as we also offer the service to the transacting public. I thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, just for the technicians in the back of the room, the, the, the screen for the speakers is going blank on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. Just got to mention that it gets confusing for a speaker. Mm -hmm. I would now like to invite our second speaker uh, to, to, to come, or you want to present to the presentation from where you are, or come over here, but please, Paul, take the floor. Thank you, Bernard. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, today, I'm very happy to talk to you about uh, some important work that the UPU has been doing to encourage digital transformation and digitalization of postal services. Um, Vanessa has actually done an excellent job to show uh, how digitalization uh, and digital transformation can actually help um, post in uh, developing countries. Uh, become more relevant uh, to the needs of the market, the changing needs of the market. Um, and I think it's very relevant because uh, we have gone through a seismic shift in the, the last couple of years with uh, COVID, uh, other crisis. It's really focusing uh, the whole community on digital, uh, di digital transformation. And also sustainability is a key megatrend that we have in the, in the industry as well. So these two are really uh, focusing us on what should be the role of the post uh, in this new economy uh, and how, as uh, our Deputy Director General mentioned, how partnerships are, are such a vital way for this digital journey um, to develop. During COVID times, then, we have seen um, that uh, 
Hosts have adopted digital services and become more digitally oriented. We've been talking about this for a number of years now, about the importance of doing this. Uh, but as we all know, we were locked down for over two years. Uh, we were uh, isolated as citizens and our uh, contact with the outside world was digital. We were using uh, these devices um, to communicate. We were using these devices to do business. Uh, and we were using these devices to actually be in contact with uh, uh, the outside world. And so e-commerce, as uh, Venezia mentioned, became a very important function that the Post uh, had to fulfil. They also had to fulfil government services, the distribution of payments, uh, public services were, were done uh, digitally uh, through the Post, but also physically, because the postman was the only, postmen and women were the only people who were wandering around the community, um, continuing to maintain contact. Uh, and so this concept of having a, a, a digital uh, and physically enabled postal network became reality. It wasn't a dream anymore, it was reality. And we saw that in many countries. Uh, in the developing world, um, then uh, we saw a rapid adoption of technology, particularly mobile technology, uh, for the delivery of uh, financial payments, for the delivery of um, identity services. Uh, we saw e-commerce becoming a, a big thing and national e-commerce platforms, as Venencia mentioned, uh, became a focus for, for posts around the world. So this digital journey actually was launched by COVID. Even though it was a terrible situation, it actually created a seismic shift for, for our industry. And we see that all over the world. In Costa Rica, um, the Costa Rica Post developed uh, new e-commerce services, SME support services, uh, and government services as well. In Fiji, uh, even small island developing states were adopting technology and new strategies um, for uh, embracing um, digitalization. So what we um, saw uh, from the UPU's perspective was an increase in interest in our products and services. Venezia mentioned dot .post. Dot .post uh, has been uh, an increasingly interesting uh, project from the UPU to help posts uh, develop an internet presence, uh, a cyber secure internet presence. Uh, our financial services uh, was also uh, increasingly uh, in the focus point. So a number of UPU projects from our Postal Technology Centre you'll hear more about today um, also uh, were of, uh, of interest. Also, as part of this, uh, Venezia mentioned um, uh, a project that we launched called the Digital Readiness Assessment Program. Uh, and we're very happy to, to have uh, Zimbabwe as one of the target countries for that. We launched this in Africa uh, with a, a, a demand, uh, responding to a demand from our members and also from international development partners who are funding the development of national infrastructure. And they saw this increasing role of the post in the economy, again, becoming relevant because of the power of this network and because of the way Post could adopt technology. So um, development partners were interested to invest in the development of the Post. So we created a digital readiness um, capability assessment program, the digital readiness for e-commerce, to respond to those demands. And the purpose was to investigate the challenges that posts uh, around the world uh, are facing with adopting technology in, uh, in developing digital strategies and understanding what those challenges were and trying to identify um, solutions and approaches that can help posts uh, move forward on their digital journey uh, and achieve what uh, Venezia's uh, roadmap indicates as a smart post of the future, a post that can be capable to support the new customer-centric um, demands that, uh, that the network has. We all know that, that organisations now need to be customer focused. The customer needs to be at the centre and digital um, solutions can create uh, a good way for customers to be at the centre of, uh, of, the, of the, the business. With our digital uh, readiness program then we uh, deployed a team into 10 countries in Africa uh, and uh, during COVID time, so it was a very challenging uh, program to, um, to implement, uh, and I thank the consultants, uh, some of which are in the room today, who, uh, who supported the UPU in this um, project. And we went out into the field and we uh, interviewed uh, all of the different stakeholders in the postal business, um, not just the postal operators, but also the customers, 
uh, the, the government stakeholders, the regulators in the ministry, uh, and other stakeholders that are related to the environment of, of digitalization and national digital plans. And we spoke with them and tried to understand their challenges, their expectations, uh, and how um, the post could fulfill those, and also how the post could be integrated into national strategies for the development of e-commerce, the national digital strategy, the national digital transformation strategy, a number of these activities at the government level, because many times governments are not thinking of the post in terms of their future digital um, journey. They think of the post as an old-fashioned delivery and logistics business only. Now, that's the reality uh, that we are coming from that uh, position of logistics and delivery. But there are also a number of exciting opportunities, as Venezia mentioned, um, in financial services, in government services. Uh, and so our function also in uh, implementing this project was to ensure that governments understood the potential that the post could bring um, to implementing their national strategies. And so we looked at uh, uh, a number of different elements of the business as well. Um, we looked at, oh, sorry. Uh, we looked at, um, as I said, not just post and, uh, and delivery and logistics, but we also looked at operational improvements. We looked at new services. Uh, we looked at government services like identity services, uh, different types of public services where governments have uh, objectives and maybe don't know how to implement those. Uh, and have never thought of the post as a partner in that area. Uh, so we explored all of those and came up with a, a series of recommendations um, for each of the 10 countries that we uh, visited with this digital readiness uh, program. Uh, and a report was presented uh, to the ministry. As well, we've worked on a, a continental report for Africa. Um, so there's a series of recommendations uh, resulting from the experience that we had in the 10 countries in Africa. Um, uh, and that continental report will form a roadmap uh, for the future implementation of a digitalization program across the continent. Um, and with that, uh, I think um, I'd like to thank uh, Venezia from Zimbabwe and all of the countries that were involved. Uh, we also had um, Egypt, uh, Kenya, uh, Mauritania, Benin, uh, Madagascar uh, that were involved in the in the program and hopefully all of those countries uh, receive the same benefit um, that Venezia mentioned in her presentation. With that, Bernard, thank you. Thank you, Paul. Okay, before we come to the discussion, our last speaker, please, Christoph. So, um, yeah. Pleasure to be here. My name is Christoph Kopka. I'm the industry manager for the postal and parcel services at SAP and I'm going to talk about, about uh, embracing the cloud mindset for modern and sustainable postal enterprises. A quick introduction maybe also to SAP in the, in the context of the postal and parcel world. We're delivering to 67 postal and CEP services worldwide. And it's also a subsegment of public sector where we have over 16,000 uh, customers from 151 countries, um, and also including that uh, postal, postal banks, uh, subsidiaries, affiliates, and that makes up 100 and plus uh, business partners we have. So let's get started maybe with a quick analogy. Um, coming from Formula One, cars can go up to 370 kilometers an hour. And it's an amazing speed. And to maintain that speed, they have to go through brake checking, have to go to refueling engine checks. And that is what the pit stop is about. So the pit stop in Formula One has developed quite significantly in the 60 plus years of Formula One, coming from 60 plus seconds per pit stop, now down to about two seconds. So that's an amazing transformation, right? So how did they achieve it? Well. I mean, quite frankly, it's not only about the technology in the car or how fast cars are going. It is more a, a considerate approach of the whole system. Where do you improve the whole system and not just single elements? Coming back to maybe postal market trend strategy we are, we are seeing, in this market environment we see competitors coming in, um, customer demands changing, market trends changing, revenue streams changing, right? Um, so it's going to be a key deterministic factor of who can adapt the fastest, fastest to these changes? And that's going to result in who's going to be a winner, uh, just merely, maybe a merely adapt organization, 
or who's going to be overtaken by the competitor and being left in the dust at the end. Cloud solutions. Cloud solutions can help with that. Um, a faster time to innovate um, due to the faster release cycles, also a better feedback system. So how, how do you think about cloud solutions? Well, don't you think about cloud solutions as a piece of technology. You have to redefine how postal services see their responsibility in their countries as an operator and what value they deliver to customers and citizens in the country. If you look at the cloud project or a transformation project just as a technology replacement or a deployment option, um, and you keep the business processes the same, you keep behaviors the same, you keep patterns the same, there is no transformation. Culture is key, and culture is hard to change. But we need to transform as an organization to stay relevant in the current market, marketplace, in, in, in the economic, in the present, as well, and in the future. Earn your customer every day. That's a mantra which can help you to realize um, where we are on this cloud journey together. So a, a company that has really coined that phrase is Amazon. The number one thing that has made us successful by far is obsessive compulsive focus in the customer. That's a culture, but that's also an, an operational model, right? Um, having the customer at the center of your core business at everything you do, every single step you take, this is their day one mentality. So day one is about being agile, being trying things out, and being innovative. But day one also means to try things out and to be brave enough to fail and learn. Yeah? So, and then at the end, of course, delight the customer better from these kind of learning experiences you have. So what, what would happen if, if um, we don't know what the customer wants? Yeah? And you can maybe see an example here. This poor guy bought a rug online, didn't meet his requirements. Yeah? So, but OK, how can, we, how can we understand customers' needs better? Let's take a look at what we did with uh, Post Office UK. So the Post Office UK um, has branches um, across the whole UK, over 11,000 branches. And they were, their biggest challenge is maintaining or improving even the service level across all of these branches. So they partnered up with us and said, hey, you have a cloud solution for experience management. And now customers going into these branches give feedback um, to the post office, incidents get reported, and the best practices get shared across the country. And this is the result you see. So the Post Office UK is now the number one rated public services entity by NPS in 2021, and that's still holding strong. So that's a great example of exceptional customer service, right? So the second mantra I have is data-driven decision-making. Why is data important? Well, as Edward Stemling put it, Without data, you're just another person with an opinion. OK, data is important, so what? What should we measure? What should we look at? Well, maybe start with the most impactful, most critical data to your current operations and analyze this. However, I think there needs to be a common understanding of why this data is important, how we analyze it, and how we interpret it. You might have heard about survivorship bias, right? For those who don't know, planes from a US military mission came back from the war, and basically they did this um, analysis of where planes were shot at yeah, to make an adjustment of reinforcing these kind of parts. Yeah? And well, if you're, let's say, an un uneducated um, um, military personnel, you could say, OK, I'm, I'm going to put my reinforcement there where the most red dots are, because that's where the most bullets hit, right? But the planes who didn't make it back, that was not taken into account. So you can see the, the cockpit, the engines, right? Every bullet that hit there, no plane made it back. So these are the areas which need the reinforcement the most. We are sometimes looking at data um, we see in front of us um, at the expense of the data we don't see. And that leads to survivorship bias. So we need to provide teams with a complete view of the business and, um, and also uh, what the customer wants. Yeah, and this is how we can overcome this survivorship bias. A few examples also from 
what we did uh, with customers who went with us in the cloud. Here we have CTT and Post Italiane. They were able to standardize a lot of the processes. They come from legacy systems, a lot of um, uh, maintenance cost reduction in custom code. Overall, a simplification in the, in the digital landscape. Now, um, reducing also the systems they have and reporting from one single um, source of truth. Yeah? That, and that creates um, uh, more effective reports and real-time analysis and simulations, where you then can decide better on actions to take. And they measure 20% also improvement in operational efficiency also with that. But don't take it only from our postal customer base. We have a far more reaching um, base who are venturing with us on this um, cloud journey, which um, most of you already have set up on. And these are some KPIs um, you want to look at and want to take um, maybe a try for, for um, process automation or artificial intelligence. So this is how you embrace cloud mentality and become maybe the faster race car on the track. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Christoph. Be careful, of course. <laughs> Just looking here whether there are any questions. So, what I said in the beginning is still, of course, valid. So, if you have any questions, raise your hand or, or send them in via the, the swipe box. Um, Thank you very much uh, to all three of you. It was, was really very interesting as a start to, to, to see um, kind of the different needs, requirements. Let me start with Anencia. I mean, you, you, you were describing your journey into the e-commerce e -commerce marketplace that you yes. developed. Can you say a few figures about that? Growth, for example, that you experienced over the time, um, how, how, it, how it was growing? Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. So for the e-commerce platform, like I mentioned earlier on, we launched it in 2017. Yeah. And the numbers were very small from around 2017 to, um, to 2020 when we then rebranded. We're talking of about um, less than 500 visitors on our e-commerce platform. Mm -hmm. And then like some of the challenges or in terms of perception of online shopping, I think we're contributing to, to those uh, low figures. We also then felt as an organization that on our e-commerce platform, let's us give, us a, give it a national appeal so that everyone will realize that we really need to partner the post and we then rebranded it to be a national online platform where we now had different um, e-sellers coming into the platform because for a person to think to be selling his hardware components at a post office by naming it Zimbabwe Zimpost Mall, people might shun away. But by giving it a national appeal, we then ensure that um, a person might not be limited with the type of industry that they are offering. And with the coming in of uh, COVID-19, it really accelerated uh, growth on our e-commerce platform, where we, in 2020, we started recording numbers of about 3,000, 4,000 visitors a month on our platform. Why? Because people then realized that the post is still relevant to offer the physical, um, the last mile delivery, the first mile delivery of these components. And with the national induced lockdowns, people started embracing online shopping. And then that's when we really saw growth. And from that period until now, people who were now using online shopping um, during COVID-19 and during the, during the national induced lockdowns, um, then did not leave that habit. They then continued. So I think that's how the growth has been like. We still need to ensure that we market more to ensure that people embrace online shopping, particularly in different, um, I'm sure in different countries, mm -hmm. the, um, the embracing is, is being different. Um, so that's how um, our growth trajectory has been like is, is Zimbabwe Post. Yeah. yeah. Just look around the room here. Um, there is a question from over here, please. Yeah, but that's just a follow maybe, maybe with the microphone, you know, for the people who join remotely, <laughs> that they also yeah. can hear um, the question. Just as a follow-up question <clears throat> to uh, Bernard's question, how does uh, Zimpost generate revenues from Zimbabwe Mal? Okay, so we have got uh, four different um, revenue areas. So we have um, e-sellers. These are different organizations that are sitting on our mall and they, we earn a commission of the gross sales. So e-sellers, it's a one revenue area. 
Then we have advertising, because we have, name, we have made it a national mall. We have different organizations who do not, who do not, necessarily, are sitting on, do not necessarily need to be sitting on the mall, but they are offering their services, they are advertising their services on our mall because of the number of visitors who have been visiting our mall. Then we also have last mile delivery, where we have organizations that already have got their malls and they've partnered Zimbabwe Post to offer last mile delivery for the goods that would have been bought on their mall. So we have organizations who sit on our, um, whom their links will be sitting on our mall. Once people visit their mall and then they buy, um, they then choose Zimbabwe Post as the delivery partner. So we also have revenue from last mile delivery through other um, e-commerce platforms. We also have online advertising, and we also earn our revenue through commissions for various organizations that are actually sitting on our mall. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. There's another question here, and then another question there, please. Yeah. Well, wait for the microphone, please. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for Yes, thank you for the presentations and uh, my question to the to the poll. Uh, I wanted to ask what were most uh, difficulties that you faced implementing uh, these programs in different countries? So, as I mentioned, uh, we undertook this project during COVID time, so there was a number of difficulties around uh, COVID times. But in terms of uh, what we found um, in the different countries, uh, there was a, a number of um, countries where we found there was a complete disconnect between the government and the postal operator in terms of the role that the post could play in, in implementing government services. The governments weren't thinking about the post in a very wide, innovative environment. Uh, and so uh, that caused us a challenge because sometimes to actually go and knock on some ministers, uh, minister, other ministry doors to talk about the post, they didn't understand the context of why we would want to talk with the Ministry of Internal Affairs about the role the post could play. So we had to do a little bit of an education uh, also with the government to make them realise that the post is a multifaceted business. Uh, as I mentioned, not just a logistics and delivery business. And, and uh, opening that conversation up then opened their eyes to the fact the post could be a really critical national infrastructure for a number of different government programs. Uh, and that was quite exciting. Let me follow up on that maybe. Paul, how did you find those, those 10 countries? Did they approach you and say, okay, we want to be part of this exercise? Or did you reach out to them and then did you reach out to the post or to the government or to both? So we had requests from, um, uh, as I mentioned, our development partners who are investing and preparing national digital strategies, national e-commerce strategies, and they saw some challenges with universal inclusion of SMEs in particular in the remote and rural areas. It was very easy for them to identify partners in the capital cities, but partners in the rural and remote areas was a challenge for them. And so um, they approached us to see whether the post could be potentially reschooled, uh, reskilled, retooled uh, to be capable of this. Now, as I mentioned, um, uh, this, this is a big journey for posts. Uh, they're coming from a very traditional business. So a lot of that is involved in working with partners. So um, that's where uh, we see the, the potential in that. We also worked with the African Union Commission to identify these 10 countries so that they spanned the continent and were representative of both the economic situation as well as the cultural situation on the continent. And together, we identified those 10 countries to, to undertake this assessment in. Perfect. There was another question. When you ask a question, please just state also who you are and from which organization you are. I think that's easier. It was Walter first. Please, Walter, and then we come here. Thank you. Thank you very much. This is Walter Trezek, the chairman of the consultative committee of the UPU. Um, thank you very much uh, for this very insight presentation from Zimbabwe Post. Also, thank you very much uh, for the presentation uh, of uh, SAP. Um, <clears throat> it gives a very clear picture that out there um, is a huge change happening, and it's obviously also gaining speed. Um, looking at the chart up there um, on the screen, partner to transform, um, my question is very forward-looking now. Um, what can the UPU do better? Um, what kind of resources um, uh, are important uh, to the UPU, um, what kind of additional partnerships might help the designated operators, might help uh, the wider sector players to better engage? Thank you. 
Who wants to take the question? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I mean, I, I can start maybe, and then you follow up from, from your point of view. I think, um, first of all, you need to have people in the room, like today. Right? We need to talk, we need to talk about things um, which are relevant. And um, just being in this venue today, we already talked uh, with UPU members about what we could possibly do in regards to the IPS system, for example, right? Because we have a lot of the, the same customers as well. And um, to provide um, the, the, the most benefit out of both organizations, I think we need to, to just partner and, and start with a conversation and see where that goes. Yeah? And that's the initial step. And now, with these events, meeting people in person, that gets easier. So um, that's the first step we can take and we will take. And we see where the journey goes from there. OK. Um... I think um, what UPU uh, can do, they have already uh, begun, I think, the processes, like I mentioned earlier on in my presentation, to say um, the issues of um, digital technology, the way um, it is evolving, it's, it's fast and it becomes maybe difficult for de uh, designated postal operators to keep pace. And what uh, UPU is already doing to, through um, telematics, uh, the dot post, the IFS, on the spaces that we are filling as designated operators that we are supposed to be tapping into. So that investment in uh, digital technologies uh, where different de designated operators can then tap into such technologies, it makes um, uh, life easier for DOs to then participate in, in, in um, offering uh, digital services. So I think uh, the need for DOs to embrace these technologies that uh, already UPU is doing, I think it will go a long way in ensuring that we really improve in terms of service delivery. And also to look into um, efficient delivery systems that we can then also um, um, improve on as far as uh, the last mile delivery of these uh, services is concerned uh, between designated operators. And also the operations readiness for, for e-commerce programs, for example, they ensure that people can actually exchange information, they exchange knowledge as they are part and parcel of such programs, and it improves postal interoperability and also even um, um, partnering private players as well. Yeah, yeah Walter, I think it's a great question. Uh, I think you probably have some very interesting answers to this mm -hmm. question as well yeah. as the, the chairman of the consultative committee. But I think there's three issues that, that come to mind immediately for me in the context of, of, of digital where, where I'm working. And the first is that uh, what, we are work, what we are working to do is work with our partners in the governments. Um, to make them more aware, uh, as I've spoken to you before, about the capabilities of post and also the importance of protecting digital postal infrastructure as well. Once we all go digital, then the criminals will be there. Uh, and so we have to make sure we protect this digital postal infrastructure and cyber security and integration in national cyber security agendas is really critical. The second is working with the industry who have solutions already. Uh, and making sure that those solutions are adopted uh, within the postal network. Uh, and so, you know, this discussion around partners today, as uh, Christoph mentioned, is really vital. And then the third thing is actually uh, ensuring a, a, a co-opetition is, uh, is encouraged um, and that interfaces between the different um, stakeholders are developed. And at the UPU, uh, we have uh, APIs. We have a program of APIs, which is about integrating different solutions together in the e-commerce space to link it to the postal network, in the payment space to link it to postal payment services, uh, and in other areas as well. And I really think that that is a practical, concrete outcome of a partnership, not just signing an agreement to say, yeah, we're going to work together, but actually building interfaces so the systems can integrate together. Perfect. Thank you very much. Please, we need the microphone here in the front. <clears throat> Hello. Good morning to everyone. I am Nikola Trubin here representing CERP, European Committee for Postal Regulation. Uh, thank you for all our presenters and their interesting contribution. Uh, my intervention is like a uh, remark and maybe a question you'll see. Uh, I, I tried to follow the mindset of the governments and regulators. And 
What's the problem? Uh, from my point of view, we have a lot of progress in the field of postal operation technology, but not in regulatory framework. And a, a regulatory framework from UP level is 25 years old. We are talking about basic need, parts and services. And it's very, very hard to talk with the governments and how to include, as a policymaker, how to include digital services, services of postal network into the appropriate regulatory framework. I think uh, that UPU needs to take initiative in that field, as well as European Commission on a regional level, because last directive was released in 2008 before uh, smartphone is uh, establishing. So I think that governments read the regulation, and it's very, very hard to include digital services in regulatory framework. And I think that we need a lot of progress in that field, and that will help uh, in implementation of, of this digitalization through the, through the global postal network. And for sure, uh, well, I think that we need to take initiative in, at that level. So thank you. Thank you. Please, Paul. Yeah. Uh, I think it's a great comment from Nicholas, and, and thank you for making that comment. Um, just to, to say, uh, I don't have the solution at the moment, but just to say we actually are embracing this uh, within the UPU, Nicholas, and in fact we have a, an innovation forum uh, being held this week in Bern, uh, and one panel of the innovation forum within our operations council is discussing how can there be regulatory innovation or innovation in the regulatory space to actually open up a different approach to, to regulating? And also, how can regulators adopt technology um, to, uh, to, in, to look at the market situation uh, as well? So how can that help regulators be more adaptive uh, to innovations that are coming along? And so uh, uh, it's a great comment you made, yeah. Uh, so, uh, the regulators follow the policy. If we do not include the digital service into the policy, regulators are not policy makers. Mm -hmm. So, the governments are policy makers. I think that... And that's exactly why we are working at the policy maker level. We're working on national digital strategies uh, with the government so that policies are adapted to the local assets that the governments actually have. Because in many of the countries around the world, this is still a public network. Uh, and a public infrastructure and a critical public infrastructure as has been shown during COVID. Last question, Graham, please. <clears throat> Thank you. Yeah, I think it just, just a follow-up to... Uh, sorry, my name's Graham Lee. Um, I'm a postal policy specialist. So follow-up to uh, Nicholas' uh, uh, question or comment. Um, I mean, I think one of the problems... I, I've worked in more than 75 um, developing countries on postal projects. And uh, I think one of the big problems, is, it's great what you're doing, Paul, in terms of this digital readiness. But for me, one of the biggest problems that exists in developing countries is their postal readiness. They can't deliver postal services. And I've just been working in Pakistan uh, Post, and uh, Pakistan Post has pretty much lost all of their traditional mail to 270 um, courier operators. And I think part of the problem there is that they have a... Uh, they have a law which says everything is a monopoly for Pakistan Post, but actually that's just been taken away because there is no regulation and there is no government policy. Uh, so I, I, think, I think one of the things that the UPU can do is, is following on Nicola's uh, uh, comments um, about um, uh, working on policy at a high level, uh, but also doing far more work on getting posts postal ready so that they can actually deliver the basic services. Because if they can't deliver basic services, they're not going to be able to deliver any other kind of services either. Mm. That's why I think also that maybe this cooperation or this, these readiness programs can very much help actually in this process. What, what are the next steps just for the readiness program? Um, you, you have studied and analyzed now 10 countries in Africa. There are many, many more countries out there that probably need your help. <laughs> Are there any plans uh, for the near future to, to analyze more countries or can you say maybe a few words just as an outlook? Yeah, thanks Bernard. So it's a demand driven um, um, program. All of our readiness programs are demand driven programs. We have a, a series of readiness, as has been mentioned, we have operational readiness for e-commerce, we have a digital readiness, we have a payments readiness. 
Uh, we're working also on uh, sustainability readiness programs. So the UPU will have a suite of readiness programs which will be tools for policymakers and operators to improve and address some of the, the, the points that have been made in questions today. In terms of the digital readiness program, then uh, it's demand driven. So we actually have a pipeline of, uh, of new requests from member countries mm -hmm. to actually come and do digital readiness assessments. These are presented to the ministry. Um, so they're at government policy level to, to answer some of the, 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 the requests there. We uh, are also now working in the Pacific. Um, we have uh, demand from the Pacific Islands and from small island developing states to undertake these assessments. So we're excited actually by the response to, to this program that we've done in Africa. Uh, and we see actually a long pipeline in different regions of the world uh, that we can do these and integrate the post international strategies. One very last question from Elma, who was first. Okay, two, two more questions, if they are brief, because then we have to break. <laughs> Elma, go first. Elma Toymer, a former postal manager. Um, Graham's question just now opened for me a, a can of worms of a real problem. He just said he's worked in a country where the basic postal service seems to have been taken over by many, many competitors. So my question really is, apart from you keeping your jobs, why is it necessary to have the postal service in the long term if it's possible for markets to take over? Why is it important, and not in terms of your jobs, but in terms of uh, infrastructure in the country? So the relevance of the post, who wants to mm -hmm. <laughs> take on that? Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, um, I think I'll take that one. Mm -hmm. um, the post, the way it was um, established from, from time immemorial, you can look at, um, in terms of location, there is um, no organization that has got the inf physical infrastructure as the post, the experience of the logistic services, its closeness um, to the communities. And um, with that kind of infrastructure, with that kind of investment that has been done since time immemorial to ensure that the communities are saved, both um, either on postal services, on financial services, um, on a number of services that the post can actually offer. There is no better um, organization uh, which has got a span of experience in terms of logistics as well than the post office. So this post will remain relevant because of its physical um, infrastructure. The tricky part about private players is that when they come in, they will only save uh, maybe... Um, areas where it's profitable for them. And there are marginalized communities that can be left behind uh, in terms of access to these services. And you then find that if the post is allowed to, 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 to die and it's not able to recuperate its cost in other commercial uh, locations, then we have done a disservice to the communities because the posts will stand for the commercial role, for the social role, and for the international role. I think that's my... Uh, I think that's, yeah. that's quite clear as well. Mm -hmm. Maybe the microphone here, Elmo, if you could pass it. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, thank you very much. My name is uh, Chief Moyo. I'm the Secretary General of the Pan-African Postal Union. Uh, I would like to thank the panelists for their uh, presentations and interventions and thank you very much Vene for that powerful presentation and uh, interventions. Um, I want to come in with a small example uh, of Lionel Messi. I'm sure we know him as a football player, very good, but uh, can Lionel Messi play American football? <laughs> the answer probably is no, because these two footballs we are talking about are different. And take that, bring it to the postal sector. Uh, the government have, over the time, developed their own understanding of what the sector is. And the players 
the operators, the regulators, have their own understanding of what the postal sector can do. And I am happy that uh, from the presentations, it's also coming out that there is a lot of marketing which is required so that uh, everyone can be uh, singing from the same hymn book. When we say digitalization of the post and what it does, the government doesn't look at it like uh, the post has lost its direction. The issue is that uh, the post is uh, a platform. They do not detect what people should be sending, how they should be communicating, but they make sure that the pipeline is always ready and fine-tuned to accommodate whatever the consumers uh, want and whatever the citizens want. And uh, most importantly, the post has to play the role of ensuring that it facilitates, whether it's trade facilitation for SMEs, whether it's government e-services, so that citizens can, can enjoy. So uh, the post still has that uh, role to play. And then finally, uh, I would want to say that uh, uh, looking at where we have come from, it is really necessary to say the private sector the government, the operators, the regulators, everyone has got a role to play. We cannot substitute one for the other. It is important that that collaboration happens in the spirit of knowing that each one has got a role to play and uh, therefore we should all thrive in, to ensure that in our space where we operate, we do it to the best of our abilities. And uh, thank you for that. I do not have any further intervention. I think that was a, that was a good final statement for this session, actually. <laughs> because, no, it really, it really highlighted very much, actually, um, that this role of the posts is very often forgotten. Um, even after COVID, after the pandemic, when, uh, when we really saw how important the infrastructure is, or when we hear, for example, that, okay, but private... Uh, competitors come in, uh, they are cherry picking, of course. So it's, it's, it's not really the society that benefits at a large in the end. So, but maybe also taking from the three presentations, what I've heard, maybe what we need as well here when we talk about partnerships, and today we talk about partnerships, what we need as well is maybe a partnership, a new partnership between the posts and the government. Mm -hmm. Because there's this missing understanding on the government side very often, hey, there is a partner out there that can do the job for me, that can do the job. Maybe it needs a push into more digital, um, into more digital tools, into, into, into becoming digitally ready to provide a lot of different services that the government needs, but the partner is out there. It's the posts. So I would like to thank our three panelists in this first session. Mm -hmm. We have a 10-minute break and start again at 11 o'clock sharp. Mm -hmm.